Hello and welcome to the Knife Magazine YouTube channel. Today I'd like to share with you a, an interesting little collection of very rare, very early American-made pocket knives. Uh, uh, the, the story of this fellow, whose name was Samuel Mason, is, is a fascinating one as he represents one of the original Sheffield Cutlers who came to America and helped establish the American pocket knife manufacturing industry. Uh, starting in the 1840s. This particular collection you see before you, as small as it is, represents about 25 years of my collecting knives associated with Samuel Mason. So the, the story you see here, Samuel Mason's story, an English cutler's experience in America is what we called it. It was published in the August 2000 edition of Knife World magazine, uh, which I edited at the time and today has evolved into Knife magazine. So this, this story was one of the first really large stories uh, that I wrote and one of the first really big research projects that I did on cutlery history. So I'm going to change the video setup here and let's look at some of these knives. So the, the collection I've gathered here sort of represents the history of Samuel Mason uh, as he uh, went through his apprenticeship, as he worked for different manufacturers, as he started different manufacturing firms through the course of his career in, in cutlery. Um, so let's look at a progression of these things. Now to start with, we would need a knife from Joseph Mappin and Sons of Sheffield, which I don't happen to have one right now. Um, but I will insert here a, a photograph of one. I know there's one in my father's collection and uh, sometimes they've moved through, but I don't have one at the moment. Um, when he left the Sheffield firm of Joseph Mappin and Son, he came to America at the time of the early years of the Waterville Manufacturing Company. He wasn't a founder of the Waterville uh, Manufacturing Company, but he was not uh, he was involved in the early years here. So here is, um, here is an early Waterville lockback. I love lockbacks. Um, this one has ivory handles double gimp shield, kind of an unusual one, and a blade ground like a dagger, although not sharp on the top edge for obvious reasons. Um, but a, really quite an early Waterville Cutlery Company. Samuel Mason left Waterville to help found the Northfield Cutlery Company. And uh, I don't have a bunch of Northfields around, but uh, here's kind of an interesting Northfield uh, four blade pen knife with this unusual uh, handle design. Really cool little knife. This is a, a pretty old Northfield. Um, I don't know if it was made when Mason was there or not, but a, a pretty early one. So uh, when the Catlin brothers took over at Northfield, they fired Mason, and Mason went west to western Pennsylvania, where he founded, with a, a fellow by the name of Edward Binns, a company called Bins and Mason. Now, Bins and Mason was founded in early 1866, and it's very rare to find a knife marked Bins and Mason, but here is one. So, th this knife right here, again, is marked Bins and Mason Pittsburgh Cutlery Company. Any knife marked Bins and Mason is extremely rare, and uh, we believe that Bins left the firm late in 1866, maybe October, um, maybe a little bit later, maybe a little bit earlier, we're not quite sure, but in this particular case it has two different company names on it. It's Bins and Mason and Pittsburgh Cutlery Company, all in one stamp. Eventually they quit using the Bins and Mason name and transferred it all over to Pittsburgh Cutlery Company and at some point Bins left. So this knife represents the time period that Bins and Mason were together in Rochester, Pennsylvania. Now here's another knife. This is a, a four blade Senator pen, with pearl handles. It has a, a broken blade and a couple of lazy blades and I think a, maybe a crack in the handle. It's kind of rough but this one is marked Pittsburgh Cutlery Company and then on other blades Rochester, Pennsylvania. So this knife represents most likely Pittsburgh Cutlery Company after Bins left. So let's say October of 1866 into early 1868. Very, very rare. You know, any Pittsburgh Cutlery Company knife, any Bins and Mason knife, 
is extremely rare to find. Now those of you who are familiar with uh, the Goins Encyclopedia of Cutlery Markings books may recognize this knife because this is the knife that was pictured in his books from I don't know if it was in the first encyclopedia. I think it was in the first encyclopedia. It may have been in, in one of the pocket knives, markings, and manufacturers and dealers books. Um, but this knife is only marked Rochester, Pennsylvania. That's all it says. Uh, and if you didn't know that Bins and Mason was in Rochester, Pennsylvania, you wouldn't know who made it. And there wasn't anybody else there to make it. Bins and Mason and Pittsburgh Cutlery Company. This simple one blade jack huge nail nick for some reason kind of a boy's knife and if you look at it, it's really interesting you can see how worn the handles are in the middle from somebody carrying it using it that's a simple knife but this is this is the one that is pictured in in john's book i was really excited to get it uh, john john was a good friend uh, and i was able to get a few knives from him here and there extremely rare knife uh, and again you know, we don't know really when this era was, but sometime between early 1866 and early 1868, and quite possibly in a narrower window than that, it's just, it's hard to tell because the markings aren't complete. You know, was the company Bins and Mason at this time, or was it Pittsburgh Cutlery Company, or was it something else altogether? Don't know. So, moving on, we have another Pittsburgh Cutlery Company knife. And this was the one that got me started because I've always been fascinated with lockback patterns. And, and this lockback I purchased and it was marked Pittsburgh Cutlery Company. I didn't know what Pittsburgh Cutlery Company was, but it looked like an early American knife to me. So I purchased it. It's got horn handles and proceeded to do the research. And of course I went to Pittsburgh and there was no Pittsburgh Cutlery Company in Pittsburgh because it wasn't located in Pittsburgh. It took some working to figure out that they were in Rochester. Ultimately, this knife wound up in uh, Goins Encyclopedia 2, the last edition, uh, 1998. And uh, this is a, it's a wonderful pattern in wonderful condition. And the knives mark Pittsburgh Cutlery Company, you know, they date between October of 1866 and early 1868. So you're looking at about a year and a half of production there. Uh, the Bins and Mason up here, that may only be about six months of production. And all of it is just post-Civil War, barely. The Pittsburgh Cutlery Company, which after Bins left was run strictly by Samuel Mason, um, was located in Rochester, which is adjacent to Beaver Falls. And in Beaver Falls, the, well, the owner of the town of Beaver Falls, more or less, as I understand it, was the Harmony Society. And the Harmony Society was one of those religious sects that um, there, were, there were a number of them in, uh, in particularly in the Midwest um, and, and also you know Pennsylvania, Ohio, you know that sort of thing um, where it was, a, it was a religious community they kept to themselves they had their own set of laws and uh, uh, managed themselves in whatever way and these towns usually had some sort of an industry uh, in which they produced something and they became interested in the work that Samuel Mason was doing at the Pittsburgh Cutlery Company. And so what the Harmony Society did is they purchased the Pittsburgh Cutlery Company in Rochester and moved it to Beaver Falls and changed the name to the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company. Now that was the end of the Pittsburgh Cutlery Company in 1868. And the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company, well, Beaver Falls Cutlery Company is, is, has a really interesting history that I can't get into great detail about, but let's show a couple of knives. Collectors of, of early American pocket knives may not even be aware of Bins and Mason or Pittsburgh Cutlery Company or these knives marked Rochester, Pennsylvania, but most people are familiar with the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company, at least in concept, uh, that they existed um, that they were in operation a short period of time and that they have a significant history that is important to the whole picture of the American cutlery industry at that time. Um, here is a two blade boys knife marked simply Beaver Falls Cutlery Company PA. It's a knife in, in really nice condition and again it's just a boys knife got a, 
a, a long match striker pull on it and a good looking little knife. This knife could have been made while Samuel Mason was working for the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company, but he really didn't work there very long. He worked there for a brief period of time, up until, let's say, mid-1870 or so, and they fired him. Um, the Harmony Society didn't like the way he, he was running things, and so they fired him. Um, but this Beaver Falls knife could very possibly have been made during Samuel Mason's time there in Beaver Falls. Here's another one. This this one has a broken handle, unfortunately, but a little tuxedo pattern, or a Jenny Lind, as they were popularly called at the time. A little two-blade knife marked only Beaver Falls, that's all it says. Could have been made while Samuel was there, or maybe after he was fired. After Mason was gone, the, the company went through this really fascinating history that uh, has been written up years and years ago and probably should be done again. Uh, the, the company's workers went on strike and uh, the, the company resisted this to the point where they fired everybody and they brought in some cheap labor in the form of Chinese immigrants who were untrained in manufacturing cutlery. And as it works out, so the, the, the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company was in operation from 1868 to 18. 86. It's 18 years. You think, boy, in 18 years they can make quite a few knives. Well, what happened was is that the Chinese immigrants came in and they couldn't make knives like these anymore. They couldn't really make highly skilled knives because they weren't trained as cutlers. They were good workmen. They worked hard. They had skills of varying degrees, but the company realized very quickly that they needed to go make simpler things that the less skilled Chinese workers could manufacture. So they made lots and lots of table cutlery, they made putty knives, they made much simpler things than pocket cutlery, which requires a lot of skilled workmen. Finally, in time, uh, the company closed down and the equipment sat dormant for a little while until one day it was purchased by a fellow by the name of John Brown Franklin Champlin, uh, which is a name that, that all cutlery historians, uh, anyone interested in, in fine quality early American cutlery will recognize as the founder of Cattaraugus Cutlery Company. The equipment used to start Cattaraugus Cutlery Company came from the Beaver Falls Cutlery Company and in turn came from the Pittsburgh Cutlery Company because that's what was used to found the Beaver Falls Company and ultimately Bins and Mason in 1866. So. Here we have, going back in time, Beaver Falls, goes back to Pittsburgh, goes back to, goes back to Bins and Mason. And from there goes back to, though we didn't own the company, goes back to Northfield, goes back to Waterville, goes back to Mappin and Sons. These knives are all very rare. Samuel Mason, when he was fired again in 1870 or so, he went on to, um, I think it's New Brighton, Pennsylvania, and raised a, a great deal of, of money to found this company and supposedly uh, disappeared in the night with all the money. Now, I I'm, have to look that up. I have to look that up in the, in the story I wrote years ago for, for the details, but that was the gist of it. And when Mason left uh, Beaver Falls, the company of Beaver Falls, the town of Beaver Falls, uh, he didn't leave a lot of fans behind. So ultimately, there, there's not a, a great trail that he left behind between his time at Beaver Falls and the, the brief time at New Brighton where they may not have made knives at all before he pops up in Canton, Ohio. And this is another very significant cutlery town, Canton, Ohio. But it wasn't until Samuel Mason went there. It was, to the, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the first place in Ohio at which pocket knives were made. And Samuel Mason, again, was the first to establish a cutlery manufactory there. Um, and that company was called Mason & Sons. It's Mason & Sons Pruner. Let's see if this will fit on the screen. Uh, here's a Mason & Sons Jack. There's the same pattern in bone. These are really stout, well-made knives. And uh, here's a 
S. Mason and Sons Boys Knife. This is this is a wonderful piece with the uh, the marking on the handle, and then the the scales are are just they they appear to be wrought iron. You can see the lines in them. Uh, a couple of different markings on these knives. Uh, some of them just say Mason and Sons. This one says Mason and Sons Canton, Ohio. Can no. Let's make some room. I've got a few more Mason and Sons knives. These uh, you know. These knives are again like all the others. They're extremely rare. The, the Mason and Sons knives were made between late 1871 and August of 1875. So here's a here's a little Whittler uh, blade shape. Probably been modified, but a uh, a little little Whittler pattern, swell center horn handles um, with a, a unique shield. How about a quill knife? Here's a quill knife, Mason and Mason and Sons, um, and uh, this is really about the coolest pattern of all. This is a, a tortoiseshell handled uh, balloon, well, sort of a balloon pattern, uh, with uh, it's got a broken blade here, uh, but this blade is a gum lancet, and this blade is a spatula. So I guess you would call this. A sort of a, a doctor's knife, though not a physician's knife, in in that sort of a, a traditional pattern. Uh, tortoiseshell scales, really rare, wonderful knife. Mason and Sons, the company, was the first cutlery manufacturer in Canton, Ohio. Were they the uh, origin of the Canton Cutlery Company? And the Novelty Cutlery Company of Canton, Ohio, well, I don't know if I can actually prove that, but I believe they were. You know, Mason was uh, always a pioneer and left quite a trail behind him. But 1874, out of business again, and there was a, there was a nice little, well, not nice to Mason, there's a nice little quote in the paper which I'd like to read to you here. August 25th, 1875. The cutlery established at Canton, Ohio, which was established in that place about four years ago by the Messrs. Mason, formerly Beaver Falls, has suspended operations, and the Messrs. M have folded their tents and silently stolen away to their native country, England. We mourn their absence about $15, the amount of subscriptions owed us. Now, Mason's son seemed to stay in America. There was an H.H. H. Mason in New England. Uh... And uh, I don't, I don't remember all the sons' names off the top of my head. But Samuel did go back to Sheffield, and uh, at various points of time, both in America and in Sheffield, he wrote articles on uh, religious topics and and sent them into the newspapers. And several of them were published. Um, at, at some point within the last uh, fifteen or twenty years, a fellow uh, found in an abandoned house up in Ohio or Pennsylvania, found in an abandoned house. Um, uh, some sort of a, a scrapbook or a journal uh, kept by Samuel Mason that contains some of his religious writings and clippings and things like that. I wonder whatever happened uh, with that. I lost touch with the fellow who, who found it. Um, but he went back, Samuel went back to Sheffield and wrote a, at least one letter to the, uh, to the Sheffield newspaper, Sheffield Independent, I think, talking about how advanced the, the knife manufacturing was in America and, and how the Sheffield so much stuck to its old ways and they should really get with the program and catch up with the manufacturing technology, which of course is one of the downfalls of, of Sheffield is they did not keep up with the technology. Anyway, that, that's my collection of Samuel Mason knives. Now going off to, to my good friend Mike. Um, a bunch of really cool knives representing uh, a lot of history and uh, pleased to be able to to show them to you and, and talk about them a little bit and uh, sort of move on now to the whatever the next collecting thing is I, I, I always have multiple collections going one collecting one thing is is never quite enough for me I want to if I can't find a if I can't find object X that I'm looking for then I'm I'm looking for object Y <laughs> so on to the next thing, but uh, thank you for watching uh, the uh, the original article Samuel Mason's journey Samuel Mason's story Was published in the uh, the August 2000 edition of, of Knife World. It's available on the knife magazine website 
Uh, if you are a, a premium online subscriber, you can read it in its entirety. And um, who knows, maybe we'll redo it one of these days and add some of the more, uh, some of the additional knives that have been found. Like several of these here were not in the original article because I hadn't found them yet. I would like to thank David Anthony, who contributed significantly to this collection. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, John Goines for all of his help with the research and in helping teach me how to research these sort of things and sharing the research he had done with me as as I returned in kind to him when, when I was completed with this. Uh, and of course to my great friend Pete Cohen who helped me get the, uh, the Rochester knife. Thank you for watching the video and uh, uh, come back again soon to see what we've got next.